Greeting. So welcome, welcome, welcome. In today's episode, you will be getting sleepy. Today we will be looking at the simple pendulum. Now, as odd as it seems, this is an incredibly important, I shouldn't say piece of equipment, but in what it helped us do as scientists. Yes, we are scientists today. And just remember, you're getting sleepy. <laughs> I actually did that. As I said earlier, we are looking at the simple pendulum, and this is as simple as it gets. Now, before we go any further, I must say that if you can call this a simple pendulum, it must mean that there are compound pendulums, and there are. So, this is just a mass. In this case, it's some Play-Doh and a, a piece of string. Now, a pendulum is essentially this. Mass, string, suspended from a fixed point. There are a few things that we need to uh, know about a pendulum. A pendulum's motion can be periodic. And by periodic, I mean that it can have a fairly regular and repeated time interval for its motion. Now, there is this thing also called an oscillation, which is a swing from here to there and back. One oscillation. The time taken for a single oscillation is called the period of a pendulum. And there was a very famous man who decided to use these. We will look at him today and we will also look at the factors that affect how this little interesting device behaves. Now that you are very sleepy, we can look at one very important person. Now he is credited with a few things which we will look at shortly. But he is basically the guy that made the pendulum famous. He's Italian. His name is Galileo Galilei. Now, Galileo lived around the, sometime he was born in the 1500s and he died in the 1600s. And he was credited for using the pendulum to perform scientific experiments. Now, that might not seem like a big deal when you have your SBAs to do, but it was very important, very, very important. Now, he was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, and he was very, very ingenious. Galileo is credited with this, the scientific method. Now, why is that important? There was a time in the history of science and the world where men of high esteem used to speak and people simply used to accept it. Now, you might be thinking, why is that so? Well, for several reasons, one of which is that your level of education you mean your primary school education and the secondary education that you have now is far higher than what most average people had back then okay and even some of the intellectuals back then did not have your education now so please do not look down upon these people just be grateful that you're born when you are which is now so Galileo came up with the scientific method now how or why is this important like I said previously people used to speak and it was accepted just this is the opinion of the bright man and we shall run with it <laughs> let's see if I decided to come to you today and say um all brown cows fly you would look at me and you would honestly think that yep Lee has lost it I might have lost it but your knowledge allows you to think that through and that in and of itself is actually scientific because you're going to think, wait a second, I've never seen a flying cow. I remember them books in nursery school when they had animals and I never saw a cow with wings. I never saw a cow fly. Cows walk on four legs. Lee is insane. You have actually done something scientific. You have processed data to come to a conclusion. And that was actually not done. And when I say not done, I mean not done. Galileo decided not decided, he was one of the first scientists that actually conducted experiments to gather data and use that data to come up with a conclusion. Now please note the process. Experiment, data, conclusion. Prior to this, most people just had a conclusion with no data whatsoever. So Galileo's scientific method is very, very important. And if you follow the method, you'll actually see some similarities between his method and your labs. So first thing Galileo said is that you have to observe something. You have to observe an event. Now, 
he wasn't up, speaking of observing a, a one-off event. He was actually talking about something that could be repeated, something repetitive. Um, if you see something, you automatically come to a conclusion. And you, when I say come to a conclusion, you assume it's happening because of such and such. So Galileo said, the first step in the scientific method is observation. I must see something. The second thing is, I, I must have a theory as to why it happens. So you observe, you theorize, and then you test your theory. Now in physics, we don't, we don't test for opinion. We test for data, for numbers. So for example, you can't just decide, um, looking at two objects, that object A, let's say the objects have the same size, that object A is heavier than object B. You, you can't do that. You actually have to test. It can be opinion. Yeah, but it's the one dark, so the one got to be heavy, the one light, so the one light. You, you can't do that. You actually have to put it on a scale, find its mass, and then say, aha, this one is heavier than that one. So you observe, you theorize, you test. Now in physics, like I said, we test for data, for numbers. We don't test for opinion. Okay, when we get our numbers, we perform calculations with our numbers, we plot graphs, we look for trends, we analyze our data, and that's the fourth step. So, observe, theorize, test, analyze data, and based on the data you obtain, you come to a conclusion. Now, please note, I said data you obtain. If you're conducting an experiment, and you find that Let's see, the acceleration due to gravity in your experiment is 600 meters per second squared. That is your conclusion based on your data. Does not necessarily mean your conclusion is correct, but that's what you got based on your experiment. If the value, for example, acceleration due to gravity is already defined, you can always compare it to a textbook value. But whatever you get, it's what happened in your experiment. Of course, there are errors and all the other factors that can affect the outcome, but still, your data gave you those values. Now, the method doesn't end with just you concluding. Remember, you observe something and that something that you observed gave you a theory. If you conclude and your conclusion proves your theory wrong, Galileo said you can go and readjust your theory and then you can retest to see if your new theory is correct. So let me go the steps over again. You observe, you theorize, you test, you analyze, you conclude. And upon concluding, you can revisit your theory. That is the scientific method given to us by the great Italian, Galileo Galilei. Like I said earlier, this is our sim simple pendulum, uh, a mass of Play-Doh attached to a string that is what we call inextensible. Uh, that means it doesn't stretch, or it shouldn't stretch. Now, when Galileo conducted his now famous experiment, he wanted to fit, find out or investigate what factors affected how long it took the pendulum to move from here to there and back. That motion is called one oscillation, and the time taken is called the period. Now, Galileo surmised that there were three factors that could possibly affect the period of the pendulum. If you look here, you'll see that I listed the three factors and I also made a mistake. Yeah, y'all should be used to me by now. Anyways, that being said, the first thing Galileo thought affected the period of the pendulum was the mass of the bob. Yes, it's called a bob. So if you know a bob, please don't say bob is part of a pendulum. It's just called a bob. He said the mass thereof affected the period of the pendulum. The second thing he said was angle of release. Now, what is the angle of release? If you notice, if I let the pendulum just hang vertically, it makes an almost perfect straight line. A line that if we allowed it to touch a surface, it would be perpendicular to that surface, meaning it would make a right angle to that surface. Now, if we displace it, there is an angle created an angle created between a vertical line from the point at which I hold or suspend the pendulum and the string itself. So again, vertical. If I move it away slightly, an angle is created. Okay, This is what we mean by angle of release, how far we displace the pendulum in terms of degrees before releasing it. If you notice, you can have a multitude of angles. 
So this is what Galileo said or called angle of release. Now, the final factor is length of string. Is it a short pendulum? Is it a long pendulum? Is it a medium-sized pendulum? These are the three factors that were investigated. Now, how did he do this? Three factors. The scientific method was, again, applied. And if we're being scientific, it would require that we only vary one of these three factors at a time. So, how did Galileo go about this? So let's say he was looking at how mass affected the period of the pendulum. What Galileo would do is get several different masses and he would attach them to a string, making several pendulums. Now, what would be done is that the length of the string, how long the pendulum is, the distance from point of suspension to here would be kept constant. What also would be kept constant is how far he displaced it before releasing it, or angle of release. Why did he do that? Because he just wanted to see how this single factor affected the pendulum of a period. Just, just that, nothing else. Now, having done this, Galileo moved on to the second angle of release. The angle of release is, again, how far you displace the pendulum from its rest position before letting it go. If you think about it, what he would do then is use one fixed mass, one fixed length, and he would just keep either increasing or decreasing how far he displaced the pendulum before letting it go. And he would time the period of the pendulum for each new angle. Finally, length of string. Now, as you would see in our kitchen lab, you can actually vary the length of string, giving you a really short pendulum or an incredibly long one. And again, Galileo kept two factors constant, which would be in this case, mass of bob and angle of release, how heavy this is, and how far he displaced this from his rest position. These two things were maintained constant as he investigated length. Now, let me go over again, just for clarity's sake. The three factors are mass of bob, angle of release, and length of string. These are the three factors taught to affect how long it takes for a pendulum to move from one extreme to the other and back. And that motion is called an oscillation. What Galileo did, since he didn't want to vary three things at one time, was he held two constant, two constant. So if we are trying to find out how mass of bob affects the period, Galileo maintained one length of string, one angle of release, but he used several different masses or bobs. And for each mass or bob, he timed several oscillations just to see if there would be any change in the time taken again. We're looking at how mass affects period. Having gathered this data, he moved on to the next factor, which for us is angle of release. So what does that mean? It means he keeps, or he kept rather, the mass constant along with the length of string. And for different angles of displacement, he timed oscillations. I'm not sure how many. And again, he got his data on how angle of release affected period. And finally, length of string, keeping the mass and angle of release constant. He varied length, short pendulum to long pendulum. And he timed several oscillations as well. This is what Galileo did. Now, for our kitchen lab, we will only look at one factor. And that one factor is how the length of the string actually influences the period. The reason we look at this is because in all experiments so far, the only factor listed here, which actually affects the period of a pendulum, is length of string. So what you would find is that the period of oscillation squared is proportional to the length of the string, meaning 
the longer the length of the string, the greater the period of the pendulum, in very simple terms. So, I hope when we actually do show you our kitchen lab, you can follow along and do let us know what results you get. We're in a lab recording this lesson at the moment. You're at home. We hope that the kitchen lab you're about to view helps you carry out this experiment at home. After all, in these days when, like I said, school is home and home is school, you're forced to become creative. The aim of the kitchen labs would be to inspire students and teachers to find ways to get labs done at home with simple, simple pieces of equipment, apparatus, paper, tape, rulers, string, even an eraser. You can use what you have to get this lab done. We hope the inspiration you find here will help you in these very, very difficult times for students and teachers. Welcome to Kitchen Labs. In this lab, we'll attempt to actually perform the simple pendulum experiment using everyday apparatus. A Sharpie, a pair of scissors, two of those famous wooden yellow rulers, a transparent ruler, an eraser, a small one, some yarn, a roll of paper tape, and a stack of books. Now, our eraser. That will be our mass, our yarn will be our string, and to make our simple pendulum, we just make a basic, simple lasso, so to speak, and we secure it around our eraser. Once it is secured, we can suspend it, and it will act as our simple pendulum. You now use the transparent ruler to accurately mark off a series of lengths. Do note, in this case, we chose to use increments of two centimeters, and we marked off 11 such increments, I do believe, making our pendulum 22 centimeters long. Now, having marked off our lengths, yes, there they are, we now have to cut the string. The interesting thing and the thing you should note is that the string shouldn't be cut too short, as in too close to the um, 22 centimeter length. I'm using 22 centimeters because that's the length we chose. And it doesn't have to be the entire ball of yarn. If you just double the length of the string, that should work fine. Now, on to our two yellow wooden rulers. Now, these two rulers and our tape are to be used to help us essentially make an arm to suspend our pendulum from. So, we place the tape on the table and we place one ruler on the tape. If you notice, the tape is closer to one end than the other. And placing the other ruler on the first one, we now fold our tape over. Again, through the power of editing, my clumsiness is not evident. But with some care, you can get it to look just like this. If you notice again, the tape is closer to one end. Now, this is an item I did not mention initially, to be honest, but I have to mention it now. The angle of release of the pendulum has to be fixed. And we do this by using a triangle that is cut in a very strange shape with an extended portion at the top. We use that extended portion to slide it between our two rulers to help us fix the angle of release. Using this triangle, the angle of release will always remain the same. So with our rulers taped together and our triangle between the ends of the rulers, we now gently slide our pendulum, which is our string, and our eraser between the two rulers. Here, you can start with either the shortest length that you choose to start with, or the longest length. For this experiment, for our version of the experiment, we chose the longest length, which would make the pendulum 22 centimeters long. Your increments can be clearly seen. Your string is fixed between the ends of the ruler. It is now time 
to do the next step, which is simple. Our books. Now, the purpose of using these very, very heavy books, if you notice, Physics on the, is the top book. Yes, Physics, the best science. I said it. Chemistry people, don't, don't, don't feel offended. But we have to use our stack of books to secure our two rulers. Now, we take our one giant stack, we split it into two, and then we slide our rulers with our piece of cardboard and our pendulum between them. And we can easily now have, or we readily have rather, a system by which our pendulum is suspended freely from the edge of a simple table. We placed 11 different markers along the length of our string. Each marker, if I remember correctly, is two centimeters, I do believe, apart. Now, that would give us an entire length of 22 centimeters for our pendulum. What we can do is start at our longest length, 22 centimeters, which would be all the way up here, and we gradually make the pendulum shorter by pulling the string through the top of our taped together rulers. Now, it is recommended when you do this experiment that you allow the pendulum to swing for 10 oscillations, okay? Now, an oscillation is the movement from one extreme all the way to the other and back. That was one oscillation. So from here to here and back to my hand is a single oscillation. You count 10 oscillations and you require the time for those 10 oscillations. Now, if you require 10 oscillations three times for each length, you can get enough data to easily perform this experiment. Now, why do we do 10 oscill oscillations three times for each length? Accuracy. Books check. Ruler. Cardboard to help determine our angle of release, string, and of course, a eraser. Now, we have it already set at our longest length of 22 centimeters. What we now will do is attempt to find out how long 10 oscillations will take. So, the apparatus has been set up, ruler, cardboard marker, string, and bob. We have phone set to the stopwatch function, it's at all zeros, and with a slight, not very long, slight audible countdown, we will now begin to determine the time taken for 10 oscillations. I ensure that my string is at the bottom left corner, as best as I can tell at the moment. And three, two, one, go. So for our first length, the first length, which is 22 centimeters, the time taken for the 10 oscillations, the first 10 oscillations is 10.93 seconds. We're not trying to bore you to death, all right? We're trying to make science interesting. So with that in mind, we will just simply speed up what we show you for the other two lengths, okay? We will not count each oscillation out loud, no, no. Fast forward is your friend. The time for the second group of 10 oscillations is 10.79 seconds. 10.79. As you can see on my lovely phone scream, to quote regular Guyanese. So we just reset and we do it one more time. <coughs> Finally, our third group of 10 oscillations. We have 10.68 seconds. 10.68, and students, please don't say 10.68. It is 10.68. Now, having recorded it three times for the first length, we have to change it. And it's simple. You just pull the string from the top through the two rulers that we taped together. Now, our first length was 22 centimeters. And since I marked off lengths or increments of two centimeters, it would move from 22 cm to 20 centimeters, okay? Because, you know, 22 minus 2 is 20, right, children? Quick maths. And we begin again. So we just repeat 
ensuring that our string is in the bottom left corner of our triangle, that our stopwatch is set to all zeros. We count down three, two, one. For our second length, the first group of 10 oscillations comes in at 9.83 seconds. As you can see on the screen, 9.83. And we go again. The second group of 10 oscillations for our 20 cm length is 9.89. 9.89. Only a difference of 0 0.06 seconds, which is actually not that bad. Reset phone, reset pendulum, begin again. Finally, for the last group of 10 oscillations at 20 centimeters, we have 9.89. Having found our third time for our second length, we have to adjust our length again. We adjust our length by finding the mark for our third length on the pendulum, and it would be the third one from the top since we're going from longest length to shortest length, and we just pull our string through to the top of the rulers so that our new mark is at the bottom of the two rulers we taped together. Now, our old length was 20 centimeters. Our new length would be 20 minus two. Since we use two CM increments, that would be 18 centimeters. Reset pendulum, reset timer, and we go again. For our first group of 10 oscillations for our 18 cm length, we have 9.43 seconds. And we begin again. For the second group of 10 oscillations at 18 cm, we have 9.51. 9.51 seconds. And finally, reset pendulum, reset timer, and we go again. For our last group of 10 oscillations at 18 centimeters, we almost got what we got before. We have 9.44 seconds, 9.44 seconds. We tried to set out today to show you a way for you to be able to perform these labs at home. That's the whole idea behind this. Giving you inspiration, ideas, that you can use to actually do a proper lab in your own home. Now, this is very important considering the time in which we live, pandemic, school is at home, home is now school. And we hope, we hope that from this simple video, you're able to perform your own lab, gather your own data, and come to your own conclusions. Now, speaking of conclusions, we know that we did not give you a definite conclusion. There was nothing specific here. We didn't attempt to give you a conclusion because we really didn't give you an aim. We were just trying to show you a means that you could use to gather your data from an experiment that is on the CSEC syllabus. Now this is one of those experiments that you have to do. So we hope that you're able to actually replicate this at home, gather your data, do your lab, and write it up. Thank you.